walls. Legal disputes often unfold in courtrooms, with violence being a rare occurrence. However, there are instances when situations take an unexpected turn, thrusting inmates into the spotlight of their courtroom drama. Below, we delve into the stories of eight convicts who met their demise while in court. Number one, David Paradiso, faced a tragic trajectory, plunging into the depths of a legal saga. This captivating tale of courtroom chaos and violence began with his arrest in December 2006 for a horrific crime, the suspected killing of his girlfriend, Eileen Pelt. Their relationship, spanning only a few weeks, took a dark turn in the back seat of a car driven by David's mother, Debra Paradiso. Debra claimed she hadn't heard any arguments between the couple until that fateful day. In a bizarre turn of events, David fatally stabbed Eileen in the neck, asserting that he acted first to save his own life. Unfazed by the gravity of his crime, Paradiso coerced his mother to drive him from Loy, California, to a location 15 miles away in Amador County. There, he callously disposed of Eileen's lifeless body along a road, shocking those who learned of these deeds. To add complexity to the narrative, Paradiso's defense argued that he was under the influence of methamphetamine during the encounter. Despite the serious charges, Paradiso was captured and faced legal proceedings. However, during his 2009 trial, the story took an even stranger turn. Before delving into the trial, it's crucial to establish the context. David's mother, Deborah Paradiso, had expressed deep concerns about her son's mental health in the weeks leading up to the court hearings. She observed signs of a potential breakdown, including a sense of despair in his eyes, and even suspected he possessed a firearm, which she reported to authorities. A search of his holding cell yielded no evidence, leading to the dismissal of her concerns. Later, Deborah claimed that this dismissal contributed to the subsequent catastrophic events. During the trial, David Paradiso testified about his girlfriend's death, offering a different narrative than his previous statements, abandoning the argument that he acted in self-defense. This dramatic shift raised intrigue and concern. A pivotal moment occurred when Deborah, overcome with emotion, left the courtroom during her son's trial. She had spoken out against David taking the stand, expressing worries about his mental health. This emotional outburst caused a disruption in the proceedings. During this brief pause, David Paradiso seized the opportunity. He attacked Judge Cinda Fox, who presided over the trial with an unidentified sharp weapon, stabbing her multiple times and physically assaulting her. Despite attempts by courtroom visitors to intervene, Detective Eric Bradley intervened and shot Paradiso. Though injured, Judge Fox was successfully evacuated and recovered. Tragically, David Paradiso succumbed to the gunshot wounds he sustained during this chaotic event. This unexpected twist left devastation in its wake, prompting David's family, particularly his mother Deborah and brother Aaron Paradiso, to express profound sadness. They firmly believed that this tragedy might have been averted if law officials had handled David's deteriorating mental health differently. Aaron emphasized that his brother suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, a well-established illness, and argued that David should not have been called to the stand in his compromised mental state. Number two, Klaus Grabowski had a criminal history that began in Germany, where authorities identified him as a repeat offender. He was initially arrested for strangling a child, receiving probation as his sentence. Despite this close call, Grabowski's malevolent tendencies persisted, leading to subsequent arrests related to crimes against children. While he initially received lenient treatment in court, the authorities were less merciful the next time. Marianne Bach, born on June 3, 1950, played a pivotal role in this harrowing story. Her upbringing in West Germany was challenging, marked by a violent father and a mother who abandoned her during her teenage years. Becoming a mother at 16, Marianne had to give up her first child for adoption. At 18, she faced another challenging situation, having to relinquish her second child after being attacked just before giving birth. 
On November 14, 1972, Marianne gave birth to her third and final child, a daughter named Anna. Raising Anna on her own, Marianne worked as a waitress to make ends meet. However, their lives remained unsettled, with Anna often left to fend for herself due to her mother's long hours at the bar where she worked. The tragic sequence of events began on May 5, 1980, when Marianne and Anna had a violent disagreement before Anna left for school. Heartbroken and upset, the seven-year-old chose not to attend school that day. Klaus Grabowski, a neighbor, lured her to his apartment under the pretense of playing with his cats, leading to a horrifying assault and ultimately her tragic death. Grabowski faced justice when his fiancée discovered the gruesome reality and promptly alerted the authorities. During the trial that commenced on March 3, 1981, Grabowski attempted to shift blame onto the young victim, painting a twisted narrative of Anna attempting to seduce him, demanding money, and threatening exposure. This victim blaming enraged Marianne, who had already endured unbearable suffering. Taking matters into her own hands, she carried out her plan on March 6, 1981, during a seemingly ordinary court session. Concealing a .22 caliber Beretta pistol in her clothing, Marianne responded swiftly upon seeing Grabowski in the courtroom, firing seven rounds at him. Six of the bullets found their mark, resulting in Grabowski's demise. A video of the shooting depicted Marianne's determined demeanor, showing no emotion even when others intervened to detain her. She displayed no remorse. Marianne received a six-year jail term for manslaughter, serving only three years. She succumbed to pancreatic cancer in 1996 and was laid to rest next to her beloved daughter, Anna. Number 3. Slobodan Praljak took an extraordinary and tragic turn during his sentencing hearing in 2017. Let's delve into how Praljak found himself on trial and explore the circumstances that led him to take such drastic measures. Born in Yugoslavia in 1945, Slobodan Praljak initially led a seemingly conventional life. He pursued higher education, became a professor, and ran an electronic business. However, during the Croatian War of Independence in 1991, his life took a drastic turn. Joining the Croatian military, Praljak rose to the rank of general and played a pivotal role in the conflict. However, his leadership was marred by allegations of war crimes, including attacks on places of worship, looting, and assaults on civilians. He was also in charge of the infamous Driel camp, where Bosniak men faced brutality and mistreatment. After the conflict ended in 1995, Praljak returned to civilian life as a successful businessman. He started a production company, a tobacco business, and authored 25 books, seemingly getting his life back on track. However, in the early 2000s, Praljak, along with five others, faced war crimes charges brought by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, ICTY. The charges included breaches of the Geneva Conventions, violations of war laws and customs, and crimes against humanity. During the seven-year trial that began in April 2006, Praljak was found guilty and sentenced to seven years in jail in 2013. He contested the ruling, maintaining his innocence. In November 2017, a court in The Hague upheld parts of his sentence while dismissing others, leaving him with a 20-year prison term. Having already served around 13 years, he faced an additional seven years until eventual release. Praljak vehemently opposed the ruling and following the judge's pronouncement, made a stunning remark in the courtroom. He sipped a liquid from a small brown container he carried with him and announced, I just drank poison. The court ordered the curtains to be drawn and Praljak was swiftly transferred to the hospital where he tragically passed away due to heart failure. Praljak's death raised various questions, notably about how he obtained the poison, given the stringent security checks at the courthouse. Despite thorough investigations, the source of the toxin remained unknown, adding a perplexing element to the case. His demise evoked a range of reactions, with some former ICT judges considering it a tragedy that denied war victims the justice they sought. 
Praljak's death left a complicated legacy and a host of unresolved issues, casting a shadow over an already challenging chapter of history. Number 4. Sayal Angelao met a sensational demise in a courtroom, presenting a bizarre story where a criminal died while attempting to assault someone during his trial for a series of violent crimes. The circumstances surrounding Angelao's childhood are partly shrouded in mystery, with limited information available. What is known is his affiliation with the Tongan Crips Gang, a prominent criminal organization operating in various U.S. states as well as in New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. Angelao's courtroom episode unfolded due to a 29-count racketeering indictment targeting 17 gang members, including the 25-year-old Angelao. This indictment focused on organized crime, and Angelao and his fellow gang members faced additional charges for their alleged criminal acts in 2014. The compelling nature of this case lies in the series of circumstances that led to Angelao's tragic demise. First, he found himself on trial in a newly built courthouse that had just opened its doors a week earlier. Second, a breakdown in communication between the sitting judge and the marshal in charge of Angelao's courtroom presence proved critical. Typically, individuals appearing in court are shackled to prevent harm to others, and marshals are notified of a defendant's restrained status. However, due to the new courthouse lacking key settings, several marshals were unaware that Angelao was unrestrained. Exploiting this oversight, Angelao executed a risky scheme. As a witness took the stand, he pulled a pen from his seat and attacked the witness. A court martial swiftly intervened, ordering Angelao to put down the pen. The witness escaped, and other courtroom attendees rushed to interfere, hoping to stop Angelao's attack. Angelao's aggressive plans were thwarted by a court martial who used his weapon, firing four bullets into Angelao's chest. Despite swift hospitalization, Angelao succumbed to his injuries. Notably, the court-martial involved was not identified and faced no prosecution for misconduct. Angelao's family filed a wrongful death case against the marshal and the U.S. Marshal Service, alleging excessive force. The case gained national attention, and in 2018, the court ordered the release of the shooting video to the public. The family claimed excessive force contending that the final three rounds were fired when Angelao was already down. However, Judge Dowell disagreed, stating that the marshal's actions were necessary to avert damage given Angelao's imminent assault. The family chose not to challenge the ruling, and the matter gradually faded from public view. Number 5. Jonathan Schmitz was involved in a harrowing courtroom incident during a high-profile trial in 1995 that garnered national attention. This narrative delves into the complexities of mental health, the challenges of public scrutiny, and the life-altering impact of a single event on everyone involved. Jonathan Schmitz's story began with a guest appearance on the Jenny Jones program, a widely watched daytime talk show known for its sensational content. Schmitz, a calm and unassuming man, was invited to the program by a producer who explained that a hidden admirer wanted to reveal their identity. Schmitz had no inkling that the admirer would turn out to be Scott Amador, another guest on the show. During the episode's recording, Amador publicly expressed his affection for Schmitz, disclosing that he had a crush on him. The audience reacted with laughter and applause, but Schmitz appeared visibly uncomfortable and bewildered. The segment was broadcast nationally, leaving the audience in shock and disapproval. Three days after the filming on March 1995, Schmitz returned to Amador's mobile home and fatally shot him. The tragic incident thrust both men into the public spotlight, with Schmitz arrested and charged with first-degree murder. The case became emblematic of the ethical constraints of reality television and the potential consequences of public humiliation. Schmitz's mental condition became a focal point as the trial unfolded, with his defense arguing that the public humiliation on The Jenny Jones Show pushed him over the edge, leading to feelings of melancholy and hopelessness. They asserted that Schmitz was not in his right mind during the crime and should face a lesser charge. In a shocking and tragic turn of events in March 1996, Schmitz attempted to take his own life in the courtroom during the trial. Pulling out a revolver, he pointed it at his own head and fired, 
causing pandemonium and fear among spectators, attorneys, and court officials. Miraculously, Schmidt survived the self-inflicted gunshot wound and underwent life-saving surgery. This event raised concerns about courtroom security and the treatment of mentally ill individuals. Schmitz's mental health came under heightened scrutiny after the suicide attempt. Court-appointed psychiatrists examined him, determining that he suffered from depression and a personality disorder. Ultimately, Schmitz was found guilty of second-degree murder in Amador's death. The jury accepted his defense's argument about the impact of the Jenny Jones show on his mental state, resulting in a lower conviction than the initial first-degree charge. Schmitz received a sentence of 25 to 50 years in prison. Number six, Brian Nichols, played a central role in a shocking and tragic episode in American legal history when a shooting occurred in an Atlanta courtroom in March 2005. The repercussions of his actions that day extended far beyond the confines of the Fulton County Courthouse in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. Brian Nichols's life story began long before the fateful day in question. Born in 1971, Nichols faced a challenging upbringing marked by a broken home and encounters with law enforcement. Despite these difficulties, he managed to graduate from high school and briefly attend college. However, his involvement in illegal activities, particularly drug-related offenses, led his life down a darker path. In 2005, Nichols, with a criminal background, found himself on trial heading to the Fulton County Courthouse for his legal proceedings. No one anticipated that this routine trip would trigger a chain of events that would turn into a horrifying rampage. Nichols initiated the violence by overpowering a deputy sheriff, seizing her gun and taking her life. He then entered the courtroom where he shot and killed the presiding judge, Roland Barnes, and court reporter Julianne Brandau. This courthouse shooting set off a large-scale manhunt, instilling fear and panic throughout Atlanta. Over the next 26 hours, Nichols engaged in a spree involving carjackings, additional shootings, and a hostage situation. Despite evading capture during this time, he eventually kidnapped a woman in her apartment. In a surprising turn of events, Nichols released his hostage unharmed and surrendered to authorities. The motives behind this unexpected surrender remain unclear, with speculation ranging from a change of heart to sheer exhaustion and the realization that arrest was inevitable. The subsequent trial for Nichols's courtroom crimes garnered significant media attention and ended with his conviction on all counts in November 2008, despite his initial defense claims of insanity. Nichols received multiple life sentences without the possibility of parole. The Atlanta courtroom shooting left an enduring impact on the city, the victims' families, and the criminal justice system. It raised concerns about courthouse security, prompting increased measures nationwide to prevent similar tragedies. Additionally, the case brought attention to issues related to mental health within the criminal justice system, as Nichols's defense argued that he was not in his right mind during the murders, prompting questions about the system's handling and examination of individuals with mental health issues. Number seven, Michael Marin, has a remarkable and perplexing story. His life started with all the promise of a bright future, working on Wall Street with degrees from Brigham Young University and Yale Law School, and holding positions at prestigious firms like Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, and Salomon Brothers. His successful career afforded him considerable wealth, allowing him to live a luxurious lifestyle with multiple properties and an art collection featuring works by luminaries like Picasso. Marin's achievements even extended to conquering Mount Everest in the early 2000s. He appeared to be living the ideal American dream, albeit an extravagantly wealthy one, as a married man with four children. However, Marin's troubles began when he fell behind on mortgage payments for his $2.5 million property in Phoenix, Arizona. Despite attempting various solutions, including trying to raffle off the property at a charity benefit, none were successful, deepening his desperation. This desperation led him to commit a daring and unusual crime. Marin's house was engulfed in flames and soon collapsed around him on that tragic day. 
Emerging from the heart of the raging flame, Marin presented a perplexing sight. When police arrived at the scene, they found the former Wall Street broker dressed not to escape a burning building, but for a day at sea. The question arose, why would someone use scuba diving gear to escape a house fire? Marin had orchestrated a peculiar plan. To avoid making mortgage payments, he staged the fire, intending to burn down the house, escape using scuba gear to breathe, and then collect the insurance money to alleviate his financial troubles. However, his scheme encountered multiple obstacles. The easily accessible dive gear and the intentional setting of the fire in four separate areas around the house, using phone books to ensure its rapid spread, raised suspicions. It became evident that this was not a simple case of a home fire, but a deliberate act. Michael Marin's financial problems and his misguided attempt to resolve them led to serious consequences. Arson and attempted insurance fraud were grave offenses with severe penalties. When his court proceedings began in May 2012, Marin faced the possibility of a jail term ranging from 7 to 21 years if found guilty. Unfortunately, Marin's fate took a tragic turn in June 2012 when he was found guilty. Reacting with anguish in a courtroom video, Marin consumed something, drank from a sports bottle, and subsequently collapsed. Despite efforts to save him, Marin passed away after being rushed to the hospital. Number 8. William Stryer was involved in a dramatic and violent encounter outside a courthouse in 2003, resulting in life-changing consequences. Stryer opened fire on Gerald Curry, a lawyer in a filmed incident that left Curry injured and Stryer facing a life sentence along with 25 years in prison. The incident was captured by a TV cameraman who was covering actor Robert Blake's murder trial, unrelated to Stryer's case. The video documented a frightening sequence in which Stryer, armed with two weapons, fired five rounds into Curry's neck, arms, and shoulder. Curry desperately fought for survival, taking cover behind a slim tree. Stryer's conviction for attempted murder marked the beginning of a legal journey leading to a life sentence. The motive behind this heinous attack, revealed during the trial, stemmed from Stryer's deep resentment and dissatisfaction with Curry over the administration of a $98,000 trust fund Stryer had received following a car accident. The out-of-control dispute over money eventually drove Stryer to commit a horrific deed. After the incident, Stryer walked away from the scene with an unsettling composure, pocketing his firearms. He uttered, that's what you get for taking my money, as he exited the courtroom, leaving a lasting impact on those who witnessed the horrifying episode. During the trial, the defense presented a different perspective, asserting that Stryer believed his trust had been severely abused, leading him to think he had been wronged. They argued that Stryer lost his sanity during the incident, contending that his actions were driven by a sense of injustice rather than malice. Gerald Curry, the lawyer targeted in Stryer's violent act, expressed satisfaction at his assailant's life sentence, considering Stryer a dangerous individual. The decision ensured that Stryer would never regain his freedom. The attack left not only physical wounds on Curry, but also a lasting sense of the threat posed by Stryer. William Stryer's story serves as a sobering reminder of the volatile intersection of personal grudges and severe acts of violence. It raises questions about individuals' ability to cope with perceived injustices and the potential for grievances to escalate into attempted criminal acts.